okay. I couldn't, it was behind um, our videos. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> All right, you guys can get started whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. Um, hey, everyone. So again, I'm Molly, um, and I'm going to be talking about Germany. And I'm Catherine, and I'm talking about Ireland. And we'll have Maria join us shortly, and she focuses on Peru. And we are talking about cultural diversity in each of these countries today. Um, so for our focus activity, we were going to go through some different pictures of celebrations and traditions throughout the world. And we wanted y'all to guess and try to figure out either what continent, countries, or even if you know what cities um, some of these celebrations are happening to guess those. Okay. Any ideas about this one? Mexico. China. China. Brazil. China. Brazilian. China. Amber. 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 Yeah, it was actually, it's Brazil. Yeah. Oh, nice. Good job. China. Are you, no, um, that, the Pirates are real. That's what I Paris. Yeah, so this one is Guy Fox Day in England. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, how about this one? Germany, London. Germany. It's actually Germany. Yeah, good job. That's China. India. No, no, that's like America. 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 This is America. That's Native American. America. Good guesses. Good guesses. This one is in Cusco, Peru. <laughs> so you're right, it is in the Americas. Mm -hmm. uh, Ireland. New York, Ireland. Yep, this is St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin, Ireland. I guess. China. <laughs> <laughs> some Europe guesses. This one actually is also Germany. England. Oh, England. England. Canada. No, Israel. Good guesses. Um, this is Saint Lucia's Day in Sweden. <laughs> Germany. Germany. Yep, Germany again. Ireland. And this one is a monkey festival in Thailand. Ooh. And they have feasts for these monkeys in this town. <laughs> All right. So, and Maria joined us if you want to. Yeah. Maria, sorry. Um, so hi everyone, nice to see you again. Uh, so to continue the, the first activity we have for you, we now wanted to ask you what does cultural um, diversity mean to you? Um, if you could share it with the people that are sitting around you and then a few of you come to the camera to share your definitions. So what does cultural diversity mean to you all? Well, and we have talked about it, so based on your experiences and what we talked about in the classroom, what does cultural diversity mean to you? Talk amongst yourselves for about 30 seconds, and then I'm going to call people to go to the camera. The difference no. <laughs> All right, who wants to share? Okay, Janika, let me figure out. Okay, Janika, stand right in front of me. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think it means like the difference and people like where they come from and what they do traditionally. Yeah. <coughs> All a great right. definition, yeah. Anybody else? 
um, how cultures are like different and the difference between the cultures. How yeah. cultures. How, cu how cu cultures differ and how um, they have different stuff in their culture. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. That was great. Mustafa, one more person. Mustafa. Okay. Okay. There you go. And how cultures different than all their ideas and perspectives. Ideas and objectives. Yeah. All right. Thanks. You guys hit on a lot of a lot of good like key points that can differ within cultures. Yeah. So now we will start uh, first talking about cultural diversity in Peru. And what is so special about Peru is that a lot of it uh, rise, arises because of the geographical diversity that exists in the country. So we have three, we can divide Peru into three main geographical areas. One of them being the mountains, which in Spanish is La Sierra, then the coast, which is La Costa, and the jungle, which is La Selva. And then I have here included a few images so that you can visualize how these geographical areas look like. Um, also, it's interesting to note that Peru has 10,000 years of history, so it is the oldest civilization in South America. And due to all its uh, historic past, um, it has given a lot of time for cultures to develop and also a kind of blend. So nowadays you cannot find like a culture that's, um, you, you can find a, a lot of diverse cultures, but you can also find many that have sort of blended and mixed uh, due to the different immigration factors and just um, transition from like going from the small towns to the big cities. Um, and this has caused uh, a lot of diversity present in the country. Then we also have 12 UNESCO World Heritage Sites and a vast of natural reserves. So this also adds on to the diversity present in the country. Now, uh, I'll first talk about the demographics of the country. And as you can see uh, from the little table that there is, 60% of people are mestizo. This means that they're a mix between white and you could define it as Indian, but it's not the American Indian. It's an Indian that is typical from, from the Peruvian highlands, which is from the Andes region. So it's not the same as the American Indians that lived in the United States. Then 25% is American Indian. That's, um, they're different, as, as I just said, from the, Amer the Indians found in the United States, like the area here. Um, but it's a word you could use to define them as it's sort of similar. Then almost 6% of people are white and 8.3% are either black, Japanese, Chinese, or other. So, just um, to sum up that, uh, I think that there's no typical Peruvian, even though 60% of the population is mestizo, which is a mixture of white and uh, Indian, or from the Incan Empire, let's say, um, there's no stereotype because it's so, such a diverse country. Now, here I'll show um, two videos that illustrate how different the Peruvian lifestyle can be depending on where you live. So the first one is uh, the capital city, it's in the capital city called Lima. And here you'll see that it's extremely modern, so many buildings. So it definitely has an influence on how people interact with others and what their daily life, day-to-day -day, um, life looks like. So could you play the first video, please? Linguistic diversity. So for me, this statistic is, uh, very surprising. There are 47 indigenous languages present in Peru right now. There used to be 63, however, some have been uh, less and less frequently spoken or written and this has led to their extinction. Uh, now, it's not like it is very easy to find people that speak these 47 languages wherever you go. Definitely there's some more isolated tribes where these languages are spoken and you don't really have an access to them. Uh, 
uh, or there might be like a few languages that are just spoken by like 40 people in uh, for, like in one specific city. So it is difficult to gain access to all of them. There's three that are the official languages of the country, which are Spanish, Quechua, and Aymara. Spanish is the most popular one. Uh, Quechua is the second most popular and Aymara is the third one. And here I have written how you could say hello in each one of those languages so that you can see how different they are from each other. So usually people either speak, people only speak Spanish, then you can find uh, within the mountainous regions that people speak Spanish and Quechua. And then in the southeastern part of Peru, uh, people speak Spanish and Aymara. So it's like, for example, I'm Peruvian, but I just know a few words in Quechua. It is very hard. It is completely different how you structure like sentences. So for instance, in Spanish, you say hola to say hello. In Quechua, you say napaikuyaimi. Uh, na, sorry, napaikuyaiki. And then in Aymara, you say kamisaraki. So they're very, very different. Um, a problem with this 47 langu uh, indigenous languages is that not all of them have an alphabet. So some of them are only spoken, they cannot be written. And this definitely plays an important factor, uh, important uh, aspect in, in terms of how we preserved uh, that linguistic diversity since it is only spoken. So once the person that speaks it dies, the language also dies with them. So for the past few years, the Ministry of Education has been developing an initiative which is called the Intercultural Bilingual Education. And what they're trying to do is implement uh, a school curriculum in which Spanish is spoken, but at the same time, uh, they give importance to the local language spoken in that specific area, since for a long time, Spanish was the only language spoken in schools. So now they're trying to implement this bilingual syllabus where some classes are in Spanish and then some classes are in the indigenous language spoken in that area or town, city, etc. Um, just another interesting fact, Spanish is spoken by the 84% of the population. Um, Quechua is spoken by the 13% of the population and Aymara by 1.7% of the population. Now, um, if you will speak to a Peruvian, I think that one of the things that they say that represents their culture the most is food. Uh, Peruvian cuisine is the meeting point of different cultures, since we have uh, the roots from the Inca Empire. Uh, that is definitely like the ingredients they used to use to prepare dishes is, are still very present within our diets. Um, however, we uh, were colonized by by Spain, so also that played a role in how our culture developed. And then we also have. Uh, Japanese, African, French, Chinese, and Italian immigration into our country. So this has also reshaped how our culture is within, within Peru. Um, so every uh, arriving immigrant group has uh, left its mark on the Peruvian kitchen and has enriched it with techniques and ingredients. So for instance, the Spanish introduced the livestock, the dairy products, and the olives, the Chinese um, uh, for example, introduced the stir fry techniques and soy sauce, and then the Japanese also introduced skills related to preparing fish and seafood in general. So these are a few ways in which other nationalities, other countries have um, redeveloped Peruvian culture through kitchen, through the, the kitchen and cuisine. Um, as a result, you can see here that Peru, oh yeah, in the next slide. Uh, Peru has been named the best culinary destination in South America many times. Uh, I think for six years in a row, if I'm not mistaken. But this is definitely a great indication that in Peru, food is amazing. And that's why I think people uh, relate to it so much and identify it as one of the key points in, in our culture. Now, next slide. Uh, the Peruvian cuisine is due uh, to a cultural exchange over time. So I think this is one of the, the things that has made it so important in our life and so unique since it's not from one specific culture that it arises, but it's just a mixture of everything. Um, our cuisine represents the local practices, 
So for instance, as I was mentioning, uh, where the ingredients come from, the Incas uh, used to use a lot of potatoes in their diets, and we still do that. Um, and then as the immigrants did not have their home ingredients, they would modify their traditional dishes by using ingredients available in Peru. So that was like potatoes, corn, corn and tubers. So that's how we're an adaptation of everything that uh, came to our country. Yeah. Um, so these are a few examples of the dishes that you'll find in Peru. Um, something that's very shocking for so many people uh, that I've spoken to is mixing rice and potatoes within the same dish. But this is due to um, the Inca uh, sort of uh, way of cooking and eating. They used to use a lot of carbohydrates in their diets and we still have um, kept those traditions. Um, I could tell you a few names of the, of the dishes you're seeing. So for example, the middle one where there's like fries, rice and meat, it's called domo saltado. Then, and this is eaten in like all the country. Then the one in the right, sorry, right, top right is called ceviche. And it's one of the most popular dishes. It's made with uh, fish, raw fish, and this is mostly eaten in the coast. Then also the one from the corner left is also very eaten in the, in the coast and the fillings is, one of them is avocado and the other one is crab. So then that's also another ingredient that you only find in the coast. And then for example, the dish in the corner left, in the left um, corner that went down, sorry, right, sorry, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, those two are common in the mountainous regions. So that, for example, the one to the right is a mixture between beans and rice. So these are ingredients that you commonly found, uh, find in the mountainous areas of the country. Oh yeah, um, just one, one more thing from the last slide, sorry. Um, I wanted to mention that we have a festival, uh, like an econom uh, a main gastronomic fair every year, which is called Mistura. And it brings together Peruvian and leading chefs uh, and restaurants once a year in the capital city. <coughs> and this uh, fair began to appear as something to attract international tourism, but also to value the culture that comes from, from the culinary aspect of our culture. Okay, thank you. Um, and before we move on, I don't know if you guys have any quick questions about Peru. Any questions? I don't think we have any. Okay. Awesome. So I will move on to Ireland, which is my focus country. Um, and just a reminder, I studied abroad there. And also my dad's side of the family is all from Ireland. Um, my grandma immigrated here when she was a teenager. Um, so it has a really big place in my heart. And it's one of my favorite places in the world. And so I included my favorite quote that they say the clouds are lower in Ireland, but I say Ireland is closer to heaven. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so like Maria, I focused a lot in diversity in geography, um, ling language, and demographics. And so first I wanted to talk about the geography and the tie to identity. So there are four provinces, as you can see in this picture, split up into Ulster, Leinster, Munster, and Connacht which is north, south, east, west. And within these four provinces, there are 32 counties. And in Ireland, your identity is strongly tied to the county that you are from. Um, no matter if you were born somewhere and you move somewhere else and live there for the rest of your life, like you are always going to be tied very closely to that birth county. And people um, will often like make stereotypes off of that or they will feel a connection to you based on what area of the country you are from. Um, and I think a main reason this, or something that reinforces this at least, is athletics. And the um, GAA, which is a Gaelic athletic association, so there's different Gaelic games, such as hurling, in which all of the counties will play in a tournament against each other and that leads into the All-Ireland Final. So basically it's the glory for the year, kind of like the Super Bowl of who is the best county for the year. And so at the bottom, I have included some images of different counties' GAA jerseys. So the Supermac on the left is from Galway, which is where my family is from. And the one in the middle is their big rival, Mayo. And then the blue one is from Dublin, which is where I studied abroad. Um, so yeah, just a tie again to identity 
and the place that you are from is always going to define you basically when you're in Ireland. So you can move on. And these are just some images of the different landscapes that go with the different areas of Ireland. So up in the corner, you have Dublin, and that's the biggest city in Ireland. And there's other ones in the north, like Belfast and Cork, that are similar to it, um, but Dublin is the biggest. And then right below that, you, this is actually on the Aran Islands, which is in the west. And a defining part of the Irish landscape is these stone walls. So basically, people aren't really sure when they were made or where all they came from, because Ireland's just a very rocky place. And so long ago, these farmers started stacking these, um, these walls with these stones and there's nothing holding them together. There's no mortar, um, nothing. They just stack them on together perfectly. And they have defined these areas for farming and for cattle and things like that, um, which I think is pretty cool. And there's an old saying that if the rock doesn't fit perfectly within three tries, then it's never gonna fit. So you better pick another rock. Um, and then the bottom beside that, we have an image of a castle. And that's also important to the landscape because there's so many ruins of castles all over the landscape that were there from when there were lots of clans that ran the country. Yeah, you can see it too behind the cattle on the farm. Um, and so these different clan leaders and these different um, people would control these areas and they would live in their castles. So now there's just hundreds everywhere that no one lives in anymore, but they're just part of the landscape. Then you can also see the big sea cliffs, which are a major part of the geography because it is an island and so surrounded by water. And up in the corner where Molly was just pointing is the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. And these are perfectly hexagonal stones that are there and you can walk on them, you can do everything, but it's awesome because they're perfect hexagons, which is a really cool part of their history up there. Um, and I think it relates to something with magma and somehow I forget exactly how but somehow it made all these shapes and these stones form perfectly. So yeah you can move on. So oh, can you go back one more? So I wanted to talk a little bit about Irish and the different dialects. So while most people speak English in Ireland um, the national language is technically Irish and also English but unfortunately a majority of people only speak English. Um, and a reason for that is that, as you can see in the picture on the bottom, there's it shows the decline of native Irish speakers. And so the green shows that there used to be a lot and it's diminished over time. And a big reason for that is during the British rule, there was a man named Oliver Cromwell, who he came in, it was in charge of basically, he was violently controlling the Irish and Irish native speakers were always um, under a lot of persecution and seen as lesser than the English speakers because that was connected to the British. And so he had this saying, Cromwell had this saying, to hell, or, to hell or to Connacht, which basically meant that if you were a native speaker, you had to move to the West, which is what the Western region is called, is Connacht. Um, so that's a reason that most of the native Irish speakers are in the West. And also the name for these native Irish areas or Irish speaking areas, it's Geltas. And there has recently been a push for more people in urban areas to speak Irish. And this is important because in school, kids are required to learn Irish, um, like you're required to take Spanish or French or some other language. But unfortunately, it's not taught very well. And it can be a really difficult language to learn if you're not a native speaker because it's a Celtic language, so they make a lot of sounds that are different than what we make in English. And their grammar structure is a lot different, and also um, the way you pronounce things. Like, I feel like nothing, you don't pronounce anything the way that you think you would in English. Um, and because of this, there are three different dialects throughout the country, one for the north, one for the west, and one for the south, depending on the region you're in. And they all have very different grammar structures. And even though they're all speaking Irish, it sounds very different. Um, so for an example, in the right, I have the different ways that you would say, how are you in these different dialects. And so in the South, which is also this dialect is considered more of the, the standard dialect that they would probably teach you in school. So to say, how are you there? You would say, konasatatu. But in the North, you would say, and in the West, you would say, can we a will to? 
So again, they're all kind of different and people from different dialects can understand each other, but it is, you really have to pay attention. Um, and the Irish language is really important to me because it was my grandmother's native language and all of my family who lives there are all native speakers because they grew up in a Gelta. And on the bottom, I just have a little video that we can watch for a couple Thank you guys for your patience. Okay, let's find the right one first. And let me know if you guys can hear it. Oops. Good day, Sheila. Can you hear it? Yes. 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 Thank you. Yeah, so as you can see, it sounds a lot different than English. And like I said, it's a very difficult language to learn if you're not a native speaker because they just make sounds that we don't make in English because it is a Celtic language. Um, and also they make a lot of guttural and like throaty sounds that we don't normally make. So that's another defining aspect of the language. So you can move on to the next one. And so moving on, like I said, most people in Ireland do, everyone's fluent in English. It's very rare that you find a monolingual, a monolingual Irish speaker especially now, um, even at this point, a lot of the elderly have been exposed to English because for a long time, like I said, speaking Irish was seen as a negative. And so you basically had to speak English to be able to make a living and navigate the country that you were living in, even though Irish was the national language. Um, and like I said, now there's also been a push for more Irish speakers and Irish speaking in urban areas, which is awesome. But in relation to English speakers, there are a lot of different accents depending on where you're from and people are great at picking out, they'll hear you talk and they can immediately pick out what area or even what county you're from, which I just thought was amazing. Um, and there's different variations in how quickly you speak and the words that you say and the pronunciation. And before I show this video on a guide to Irish accents, I wanted to point out in the bottom um, this image showing Ireland on top of North Carolina as just a reminder that Ireland is less than half the size of North Carolina, but even so, there's so many different dialects and accents within the country, um, which I think is pretty amazing. So we can go ahead and watch video. Um, was a funny way of just showing the different accents that there are, and that it did a good job of explaining the differences in how quickly they speak, the words that they use, and also the different influence, such as the British in Dublin, and a fun story about that is it's very true in what they say about South Dublin of changing their accents. And I was asked, I mean, I obviously have an American accent, and I was asked if I was actually from America or if I was just from South Dublin, because apparently some people there try to speak like Americans um, to make themselves seem more posh or, um, yeah, they just change the way they speak to almost sound American. So I thought that was interesting. So you can move on to the next one. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit of racial and ethnic demographics and a history that Ireland has of monoculturalism. Um, so this can be seen today that still 94.3% of the population is white and 84.5 of those are Irish people or um, designated as like white Irish people. 1.9% is Asian, 1.4% is black, 0.9 other and 0.7 is Irish travelers. And in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about who the Irish travelers are. Um, but I think it's important to note that a lot of the Irish history comes from Celtic, Norse, and British influences. And the largest immigrant groups are British, quotes, Poles, Americans, Lithuanians, Latvians, Germans, Nigerians, Indians, Pakistanis, and Chinese. And today, I also wanted to talk about a couple terms that have been coming up in the media a lot and things that are just developing within the Irish culture. And this idea of being Black Irish, 
which is actually different from African Irish, which is similar to like African American or having African descent, but being born and raised in Ireland or having also an Irish um, family member or parent. So Black Irish actually refers to a person who has darker hair, which is actually pretty common in Ireland, but they don't have light skin like the girls you can see up in this picture. Um, so Black Irish would refer more to this man up in the top corner of having darker skin and darker hair. And this um, is actually believed to be tied back to when the Spanish Armada came to Ireland, which I just thought was interesting. Um, but I wanted to point it out because it was something that really confused me when I first heard that term when I was there. And then African Irish refers, like I said, like African American, um, to people who maybe have a parent with African descent and a parent with Irish descent. And there's a big um, festival every year called the Rose of Tralee, which is basically, it's kind of like Miss America, but there's a focus more on personality, talents, things like that, um, and how well you can represent the country of Ireland and Irish values rather than on how you look. And this year, the first biracial Irish woman ever won the Rose of Tralee, and her name was Kristen Mate Maher. And her father was originally from Nigeria, and her mother was born in Ireland, but she was born and raised in Ireland. Um, and so it was awesome that this year she could represent Ireland to the world, because um, she'll be traveling around and doing different events throughout the world this year, which is awesome. And also one more story that I wanted to share about the monoculturalism is I have a neighbor who he's Irish, and he did the Ancestry.com thing to see you know, where he was from. And it showed up that he was 99% Irish and 1% Scandinavian, um, which goes back to the Viking invasion. And that just blew my mind that a person could be 99% of something, because I feel like in America, especially, people are from all different backgrounds. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Can move on. So my last slide is back to Irish travelers and that group that I mentioned earlier. Um, so Irish travelers are actually an, indig an indigenous ethnic group in Ireland, and people aren't really sure of the exact origins of travelers, but they've been in Ireland for over a thousand years, and they actually, um, when genetic testing was done, they are Irish. So it's kind of a mystery of where they came from or how it kind of, this idea of their lifestyle developed, but they are a nomadic people who travel around in caravans and move pretty regularly. So in this picture on the top right, you can see an older picture of travelers in their like wagon caravan. And that's what most people would think about in movies. But down at the bottom, you can see more of a modern day version of that um, in campers. So these people move around in groups, like I said, will often park um, just on the side of the road or in different areas, like here they're in a field um, and they'll live there for a little bit at a time before moving. But these travelers have always faced really terrible discrimination and prejudice within the country. And they were recently named one of the most, um, one of the groups that received the most prejudice from Ireland in its history. And they have limited representation and politicians often will blatantly say like, if I'm elected, I will make sure that travelers do not get to live in these housing developments. Or, you know, I'll do more to try to assimilate um, the traveler group into mainstream Irish culture, which is really problematic. And an example of this is the Commission on Itinerancy, which is basically like people who don't have like a, a um, full-time home site. And this commission was basically built to try to figure out what to do about travelers in Ireland, but there were no travelers um, represented in the group and they basically decided that the best thing to do was to try to assimilate um, these travelers into mainstream Irish culture um, because they don't like the way that they live, basically. Um, and so most travelers, like I said, they move around a lot. So they are self-employed and often wage laborers that partake in things like horse trading and dealing scrap metal. And another issue regarding um, children is that because they move around a lot, children are often excluded from education or they have very limited education because they're moving around so often. Um, so I actually, we might have to exit the preview part, but I had a short video or like a clip from a video, a video about an Irish traveler talking a little bit about her experience. Yeah, and I think it was starting at around 49 seconds and going to 150.
that's good thank you yeah so as you can see um the travelers like i said experience a lot of discrimination within ireland but they are it's a very rich culture and one that often isn't talked about except in stereotypical ways um, so i just wanted to talk a little bit about that group within ireland and that's it for me all right, are there any questions about Ireland before we move on to Germany? We have two, three. Nate? We might need, you can come on up to the camera if you have a question or speak loudly. Yeah, he's, he's there. How would you describe the climate over in Ireland? The climate. So it's an I. it's, um, I forget the exact word for it, but it's an island in the north, so there's a lot of rain, but it hardly snows, so it's like a cool and rainy area, so normally around in the 50s and rainy is a pretty typical Irish weather, and it's pretty stable all year round. Okay. Next question. Do you um, speak the, do you speak Irish? I do not. I know a couple words. Um, I wish I did, but my grandma, she never taught it to her kids when she moved here. When you were talking about the flying, did you actually know how many actually lived there, like currently? When I was talking about the what? I'm sorry. About the funny. I still can't understand you. I'm sorry. The Pakistanis. Oh, the Pakistanis. Um, no, I'm sorry. I don't have an exact number for that. All right. Thanks. We have about um, six more minutes before school is out. Of seasonal celebrations in the country. Um, so there is Oktoberfest. At the top right, which is a celebration actually in September that goes into the first week of October. Um, and that's a beer festival um, and also just like a seasonal celebration too. And then the top left corner is from what's called Fasching, which is um, the German version of basically like Carnival or like Mardi Gras um, before Lent. Which is before, yeah. Um, and then Glühwein at the bottom left is from um, a Weinox Markt, which is a Christmas market, and there's Easter eggs. And then on the bottom right, those are traditional um, treats that you would find at any German festival. Cool, next slide. Cool, so this is a slide of kind of like typical, like stereotypical um, German culture. Are very traditional. So on the left, that's actually a picture of my friend um, who lives in Germany, Paula. Um, she's the girl on the left. And so this is her at um, a festival. And so they're wearing their traditional clothing. Um, and this is lederhosen for men and then a dirndl for women is the dress. But there's actually versions of like female lederhosen too now. And then traditional food is there, it's bratwurst, so there's usually meat, and then there's potatoes and sauerkraut. Um, soccer is huge in Germany, and then that's a, um, a stamp with Mozart on it, because he's from Germany, um, and kind of Austria as well. And then the bottom left are recycling bins, so you'll notice that there's five different bins. And recycling is huge in Germany. And like, if you don't do it, you're fined. And then at the top right is a house with solar panels. And solar panels are also very common because German Germany is very big on green power and renewable energy. Next slide, please. Thanks. So these are the actual statistics. So um, the population of Germany is around 80, 80 million. Um, that's the biggest in the European Union, second in Europe, and 16th in the world. 91.5% are German. Um, so then the second largest is Turkish, actually. And then the rest are Greek, Russian, Italian, Polish, and more. And 75.7% of the country is, lives in an urban setting, so lives in a city. 
So most people live in a city. Um, most people are German, but the Turkish culture definitely has influences on lifestyle. The official language is German. Um, and 60, 70% of people there identify as Christian. And it's almost evenly split between Catholic and Protestant. Great, next slide, please. So some cultural values are like sense of order, sustainability, directness, thoroughness, rationality, and expertise. And this is just some normal like fashion in Germany, because I think a lot of times um, you might think of like the traditional wear, but if you go to Germany, people dress like we do in America, um, but they do tend to dress a little bit more um, like fancy. Um, so you won't usually see people walking around in a t-shirt and like running shorts. Oh, and then education is also very different from America. It's much more like self-sufficient. Um, so a lot of times students will actually get out of school at one and they'll go home for lunch and then that's it. But they have a lot of homework to do on their own. And it's much more like you're choosing to be at school and so you're responsible for your own education. And they have a bigger emphasis on like trade um, trades. So not everyone goes to um, the college that like we think of for like studying history or math or something. People go to school for like becoming a plumber or, you know, be like becoming a construction person or something like that or like engineering. Next slide, please. So this is a slide on Turkish culture. It has a big influence on the food. So that's actually Angela Merkel um, on the right side. And then on the left, so there's been some recent controversy with a soccer player in Germany. He actually quit the national soccer team because he was being criticized for supporting the Turkish president, who's a dictator in Turkey. Um, and so he quit in protest, saying that, you know, like fans were just basically like judging him. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. Next slide, please. So um, immigration has also played a really big role recently in Germany. Um, in like 2015, especially, you had the immigration crisis as the conflict in Syria escalated. So Germany has been known for their open border policy um, beginning in 2015, they accepted a lot of refugees. And then in the years after that, they created stricter laws because they couldn't, they didn't have the right infrastructure in place to handle the influx of just new people. Um, so they have like an integration course. And even right now, so in the upcoming year, they're saying that this is a priority of um, figuring out how to like integrate new people from a different, um, usually like non-Christian culture into Germany. Um, next slide, please. Cool. So you guys can go ahead and discuss with a partner um, what aspects of like diversity you see in American culture and in North Carolina and just your like own community or maybe some aspects of diversity that are lacking in your community too. And if you have any questions about Germany, also. <laughs> and I know you guys only have a couple minutes, so I can also email these questions to your teacher in case you want to discuss them on Monday. Um, she can hear you. Okay. Yes, please email them. Okay. Um, do, do you want us to wrap up or because I think you guys are almost out of time? Yes, if you can email us those and uh, we can wrap up. Okay. Okay. I'll go to the last slide and I'll email you the questions. Okay. Any questions? So if you guys can get this, what's on the board, cultural diversity is and um, read this. Put it into your own words into the summary section of your Cornell notes, please. I said, read that. Blame from it. Okay. 
Hey, Kat, you're muted right now. Oh. Um, I don't know if one of you guys want to read the, the conclusion for her, or I can. Yes, sorry, Please, I am muted. Um, so we just wanted to remind y'all and the takeaway from this presentation that cultural diversity is diverse and that it's going to look different in different countries and there are a lot of different aspects of cultural diversity. Um, so especially in America, we want you to think this week about different ways that these cultures that we talked about or other cultures that you identify with, how they impact your daily life in America. All right. So thank you everyone for your attention. Um, we really enjoyed presenting to you and we'll email you the questions. And if you have any other questions for us, you can also email them to us. But have a good weekend. Awesome. Thank you. Bye guys. Oh. <laughs> Stop talking to me. Okay. Trying to unshare. All right. Good job, ladies. I don't know why it's not giving me my like controls to Zoom. <laughs> trying to end the presentation. But um, I'll see you guys on Tuesday for our last meeting. And you're done with your track project. So um, you can just come and maybe talk to the group a little bit about the two presentations that you did. Sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.